Some of the great Canadian army meet the Canadian Prime Minister, a long way from Canada. Mr. Mackenzie King, in England for the Empire Conference, reviews the men, volunteers all of them, who are now ready and set for the long rumbling ride over the thundering battlefield that is the road to Germany. Canada's magnificent land fleet, powerful arm of the Allied spearhead that is poised and pointing at the enemy across the channel. The Allied countries in the midst of war are planning and working on ways to meet the housing problem of peace. Here is shown the novel swift construction of a complete home with the luxuries that future living standards of the world may insist on as necessities. Electric stoves, washing machines, hot and cold running water, modern baths, the good things of life that come with peace. Some of these houses are prefabricated in factories. Others are built in sections from local waste materials and then locally assembled. They mean great saving in labor, but more than that, they mean homes, good strong homes to people who will desperately need them. One of the big problems of war is how to provide houses for the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who will come back to marry and live again in peace, and for those thousands of others whose homes have been shattered around them by enemy bombs and shell fire. air forces in England go about their 24-hour a day, three-way job of reducing the enemy's fortified positions, railroads, and the beginning of his supply line, his factories. In daylight, in darkness, the tempo is steadily increasing. The drone of the multimoded bombers roars to a crescendo. The first job is the enemy's gun emplacements, e-boat bases and rocket gun sites, which must be reduced as far as it is humanly possible as soon as possible. Almost as great a job and closely linked to the planned strategy of the offensive is the disruption of transport, the veins and arteries through which flow the stuff of war. Transportation centers, especially railway lines and junctions, are the vital spots in these arteries. Precision bombing stops the flow. The exploding flak looks like soft clouds as the great bombers pass through it. Soft clouds full of hot metal and sudden death that must be risked as part of the routine work of the airmen.
Then the third big job for the flyers, knocking out the enemy's war factories wherever in all of Europe they are to be found. They can be camouflaged, but they can no longer be moved out of reach of these men who ride the lead-filled skies for the cause of freedom. that has grown familiar to all of us through long months of siege, Casino, at last falls to the charging tanks and steadily advancing infantry of the Allies. The white flag is raised as enemy soldiers, worn out, sullenly resigned, come out of their long hiding to surrender. These men have been overpowered by superior force. American troops start their own private rehabilitation campaign program. Candies and sweets to the children of Casino who have gone pathetically hungry for so long. The famous Abbey, the monastery that the Germans made into a fortress, Falls to French, Polish, British, Canadian, and American troops who all played their part in the attack. Symbolic of unity is the cooperation of General de Gaulle and General Mark Clark. Symbolic, too, of the rebirth of the martial glory of France. second historic meeting of the Italian campaign, where history these days is being made almost while you wait. The first meeting was when the Americans who landed at Salerno met the Eighth Army of Britain as it fought its hard way northward. Here again, another American army, the Army of the Bloody Anzio Beachhead meets the Eighth Army, who side by side with men of the American Fifth Army have once again fought their way north. The faces of the soldiers tell the story better than spoken words. They show the happiness of the men of Anzio who held on against frightful odds and by sheer courage turned potential disaster into triumphant victory. <laughs> <laughs> 